there's a couple of things that you did with this book that I think readers may not have anticipated. And one is that the, um, the amount of documentation, research, and data you put into this is uh, an altogether remarkable thing. Uh, and I'm sure that you picked up all of that from the campaign of Donald Trump uh, in terms of... <laughs> and the second thing is you deployed a marvelous use of pop culture memes, songs, lyrics, and it made the content very accessible, I think, to really several generations of people. And I just wanted to get a sense from you why you did what you did in terms of both the research and the pop culture references. Well, thank you. I, what I wanted to do was to make sure that uh, people understood what was being discussed in my book are events and attitudes and um, other things that are going on that are happening now. This is not about something that happened a long time ago. I've written a number of history books, so I, I didn't want people to think that this is about history. This is about what's going on now, and I relate it to things that people can relate to and understand in modern, uh, current terms. And then uh, one of the key quotes I think you made uh, early in the book was something about Failure to learn history's lessons is enslavement without knowing it. And I wanted to, because you, have, you were a history major at UCLA, and your passion for history is evident throughout this. But clearly, you see a disconnect between uh, history and its full appreciation and understanding, especially by today's uh, contemporary generation. It really worries me that uh, so many people today are, are willing to uh, take actions that go contrary to their own best interests just because of uh, a desire to hold on to some things that do not add up, do not make sense, uh, or have been known to fail repeatedly, and uh, people are still holding on to it. It makes no sense to me, and uh, it worries me. You mentioned in the book uh, a continental, several continental divides in the culture. You talked about wealthy versus working class, uh, black versus white, men versus women, young versus old, religion versus religion. And your conclusion was, how many of these things are supported by fear and ignorance? And I, that seems to me a, a fundamental part of this book. Why are we hanging on to so many things that wind up, as you said, being against our own self-interest and perpetuating these continental divides? Uh, I, I believe uh, we're doing that uh, just catering to all of our fears of change and uh, the fact that we might lose something that uh, we have that's very precious when we're all going to lose if we don't get smart and start uh, doing the things that we know that work and uh, we have plenty of examples of the things that work. Why don't we follow these examples and uh, get with it and improve our country? One of the things that um, you focus on is the American dream, and you quote Bruce Springsteen uh, saying, I have spent my life judging the distance between American reality and the American dream. What about that resonates with you? Why is there such a, a gulf, and why perhaps do we not recognize it? Well, because the, the American dream is supposed to be attainable by all American citizens, and all American citizens do not have the same chances of attaining the American dream. Women, for example, are going to make uh, about $73 for every $100 that a man makes doing the same job. Um, this is holding women back and making it tougher on them. So many women are single parents, they should be in the advantage. Uh, they have a much bigger responsibility. And I, I think that uh, the fact that women have been victimized in this fashion is, is reprehensible and it needs to change. Obviously, the issues of race... Oh, sorry. Thank you. <laughs> 
the issues of race are a prominent part of the book, and we are certainly going through um, a real wrenching time culturally right now, uh, politically and in our day-to-day -day lives. And um, you talk about how difficult it is for young black people, people of color, to overcome the uh, obstacles in the way. And you, um, you mention the fact that you are obviously an achiever, somebody who succeeded uh, in basketball and obviously in several others ende other endeavors. But you also mentioned that it is a bit of a problem from the standpoint of other young people aspiring to do this and they run into all these obstacles. Uh, you mentioned that uh, they're held up as a role model, but they can't overcome the towering obstacles blocking their progress. They are blamed for their own failures. They didn't try enough. They weren't clever enough. They didn't have enough fortitude. And you point out, that's like blaming the rape victim for not running fast enough. And I thought that was a very poignant thing. And it also relates to what you call the Obama effect. And I'd like you to elaborate on what the Obama effect is. Well, I, I see the Obama effect as uh, a wonderful thing that happened that is being misinterpreted. Um, it was great that President Obama got elected, but people saw that as the end of racism in America. That didn't happen. Um, it was not the end of racism. It was a great milestone for what Americans are capable of doing. They showed the world that, uh, yes, they can uh, judge someone by his character and intelligence. And uh, given the, the choice that they had, um, he was the best choice. And it was uh, a wonderful thing to see, but it didn't mean that racism was over. We still have a lot of problems with regard to race that need to be solved. And the fact that others may not achieve what he did, or others, other athletes may not achieve what you did, somehow gets translated as they failed or they did not achieve what you did because one did. Is that a bit of a, uh, I mean, it's a misread of what these young people have to go up against. The racism still is stopping young people from achieving what they want. Well, a, a lot of young people are judged because they are stereotyped. So uh, for so long, it was a myth in this country that black Americans did not have the intelligence to do things that require uh, a very mental approach, be it play quarterback at football or be chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff or be president. And uh, so this is something that had to be overcome. Now, not all uh, black athletes or black political uh, aspirants or you know other people as black Americans, rather, other black Americans uh, aspiring for something, they might not be as intelligent as someone that, uh, you know, has gotten it done, but it doesn't mean that they're stupid, you know, and they can be very intelligent. Uh, so everybody... But the stereotype should, dismisses them. The stereotype just dismisses them as not, not having it, what it takes to make the grade. And uh, only the supreme best can make some grades. So we just have to understand that and uh, lighten up a little bit. You, know. yeah. <laughs> um, you also have a, a chapter in the book devoted to uh, religions, and you make an analogy about uh, Christianity versus Islam. And it is, uh, we somehow see it as a versus, as a Super Bowl, as you pointed out. The, uh, the uh, Muslim population is looked as the, the visitors, the suspicious visitors, and, uh, and Christianity is the home team. And that sets up a terrible conflict in which religions are pitted against each other, right. when in fact, the whole idea is to do good and to aspire to hire, and this isn't it. Um, Muslims, uh, their whole thing is to... Uh, emulate what was explained by the great Jewish uh, scholar Hillel. When Hillel was asked what is the essence of the Torah, he said to treat others as you wish to be treated. That goes to Jews, Muslims, and Christians. We're all in that boat, uh, and that's how we will be judged. Uh, and um, those of us who believe in the Day of Judgment need to get with that, because uh, 
there's been a whole lot of wrong that's occurred uh, in the name of religion that should not have occurred. And one last thing, most, I, I would say, not over 99% of American Muslims are very happy to be here and very happy that the laws of America protect their right to, to practice their faith because they can't do it in some parts of the Islamic world that they come from because of the oppressive regimes there. And I, I'm sure that they appreciate the fact that their sisters and daughters and wives are protected by our laws because in the Islamic world, so many of those regimes do not protect women the way that the Quran tells them to protect women. Muslim women are supposed to be able to choose their husbands, uh, inherit and own property, and uh, petition for divorce. Th this can't happen in the Muslim world, wow. And it says that in the Quran, and this is something that is ignored in the Quran, and it's been replaced with chauvinism. That needs to end. So, um, the Muslim population of America is very happy to be here. I can assure you that, and they appreciate what America is all about, and they obey the laws, and they respect our traditions. Yeah. <clears throat> Perhaps you could share with the audience a, a very uh, poignant description of what things were like for you as a youth in, in being raised in a Catholic family. Uh, you mentioned that you had rules everywhere. You, the, there were rules of the family, there were rules of the church, and you were coached by coaches who had very strict rules. Right. And, um, and so all of those rules and the society you were seeing as a young man growing up in the 60s, there was a real conflict in you about what this was uh, about, why, why is this happening? And I wanted to, to see if you would walk us through how you found Islam and found what you were seeking in terms of peace and enlightenment. Well, I just started to check out a, f uh, a number of issues that were important to me. You know, what was happening in the civil rights movement and the maltreatment of, of black Americans here in America. And um, that bothered me because it is a direct uh, result of, from conditions having to do with slavery. And when I saw what the Catholic Church had done in terms of promoting slavery and profiting from it, I, w I would look for something else. But I still had a, a very strong uh, belief in the Supreme Being and I wanted to have a, a, an established faith that made sense to me. So that's why I started to investigate Islam. I, I started to read about it. And uh, by the time I got into college, I, I decided that I wanted to change my faith. But it all had to do with the fact that uh, the Catholic, the Pope wrote treatises explaining that slavery was okay. And um, for most black Americans, they can tell you just from what they've learned from history, slavery was not okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and uh, just as a few hundred years earlier uh, in the Crusades, uh, many things were done in the name of Christianity yeah, that uh, were, you know, equally as reprehensible. Right, and when um, the Middle East was invaded by the people from Europe, uh, they committed a lot of atrocities. Muslims had invaded Europe. So, uh, you know, th this has gone back and forth. And, you know, it's, it's time for it to end. Well, yeah. It's, it's time for it's, it to end. Yeah. The, um, the denigration of Muslims is, comes about, I think you touched on it briefly, uh, uh, because when people are afraid, they look for things that are taking their jobs or might be a threat right. to their uh, livelihoods or uh, personal safety. Right. And, they and we've seen this throughout our American history, we've seen it throughout recorded European and Arabic history, the outsider is perceived as the troublemaker, the problem. Is there, do you see a way forward from the standpoint of eliminating that fear to try to make people understand that 
there is much more in common among the faiths than there are, there's a much more common humanity among the faiths than we see uh, when uh, Muslims right now are being demonized on television and political campaigns. Well, you know, the, the fact that horrible things are happening in the Middle East by people who claim to be Muslim, um, some of those things are, are so horrific, it, it would disgust and enrage anybody. And um, when you don't understand the, the source of that type of barbaric behavior and why it's being done and how it's being used, um, you have a tendency to blame anybody that has anything, any, anything in common with that type of behavior to be the bad guy. So American Muslims end up being depicted as trying to do what those people in ISIS are doing. And very few people from our country have gone over there and subscribed to that type of insanity. It's really unfortunate that we're portrayed as that. They even try to portray President Obama as a Muslim, and he's not. He's a Christian. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that's... <laughs> they try to say he's a Muslim. His father was a Muslim. Okay. Uh, but my father was Christian. I'm not Christian. You know, this is... Uh, that's the way it goes. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, one of the uh, other points you, talk, you talked about in, in the rule of law here in this country, uh, about you call the, the Constitution one of the most revolutionary documents in the history of the world, and yet it was created by slave owners. The, these are people who also marginalized women, and uh, they protected some immigrants and not others. And yet, this is our document. How did they work through their insecurities and their, as far as you can read from your history studies, how did they manage to produce a document that was so enlightened that we care about it today? Well, I think the Founding Fathers really wanted to work toward an ideal. And the ideal uh, of democracy that benefits all the people who participate in it is what they saw in their minds, even though they themselves were not pra practicing that type of democracy. They didn't intend that democracy for people of African ancestry or Native Americans or women. You know, their own wives and sisters and mothers and daughters, they didn't in intend that for them. But uh, finally, uh, because of the way that uh, good seems to proceed to a, a little bit faster than evil, We've gotten all of those issues settled, and now women participate in our democracy, and black Americans and Native Americans, and uh, we keep making it better. And uh, that's, that's what gives everybody hope. That's why people believe in America. Uh, that's why I believe in America, because uh, we keep making it a better place and understanding that if we're gonna take those words for actual way of acting, we're gonna have to make it real for everybody who participates. The, uh, you were a young man in the time of a lot of civil rights issues, racial unrest, and dramatic protest in the sports world by um, many uh, athletes. And, and you yourself stayed out of the 1968 Olympics. And given the discussion we're having now, and uh, we'll get into a little bit of what just happened here a few minutes ago, um, Tell us a little bit about what was happening then and why you decided to forego the Olympics and why we're still here talking about it 50 years later. Well, I think, uh, you know, the uh, demonstration by uh, Tommy Smith and John Carlos at the 1968 Olympics really was a dignified way for them to use their platform to tell the world that uh, thing, everything wasn't right in America. You know, Dr. King had just been assassinated uh, and that, coupled with the fact that the um, uh, president of the American Olympic Committee, Avery Brundage, uh, was still in charge, uh, I, I really wasn't that keen to go. For, for those of you who don't remember, uh, Avery Brundage was the, the same person who did not allow Jewish athletes to participate in the 1936 Olympics because it angered Hitler. Um, he went along with that. I was not going to do anything for someone with that mindset. Um, he hadn't apologized or changed in any way that I could 
tell had happened, and uh, that, that's really the reason why I didn't participate in the, in the 1968 Olympics. I had a very good job that was going to allow me to uh, finish my uh, undergraduate studies, you know, without a, a big financial burden. You, you, you didn't want to give up your summer job. So I couldn't give that up. For, I wasn't going to give that up for Avery Brundage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we jump ahead 50 years, um, and now we're still dealing with issues of racial and social yeah. injustice. And the spotlight, again, seems to be drifting towards sports. Yeah. Um, just before uh, we came out here, uh, Kareem had a chance to talk to Pete Carroll, Seahawks coach, uh, Bobby Wagner, who was here, and uh, it was a great conversation. Uh, I only saw parts of it, but it was talking about athlete activism and a way to um, call attention to these grievances without necessarily being disrespectful. Right. And I wanted you to, if you would, share some of what you said now because it's a lot of, you devote a chapter to athlete activism in the book and I thought it was uh, a very wise insight into what can be accomplished but what can go wrong. Well, I, I just tried to uh, explain to Coach Carroll and, and Bobby that uh, they have such an incredible platform because um, all of the people in the Pacific Northwest and beyond, uh, many beyond the Pacific Northwest, respect and want to support the Seahawks. So if they are going to use that platform where you've got all these young people and people uh, in very responsible positions like uh, police chiefs and heads of sheriff's departments and uh, other police officials, they all support uh, their sports teams. It's one place that they can go for some relief when they uh, come back from their very difficult jobs. With that kind of support from, from the community, they have an incredible opportunity to be a bridge and to get police agencies and communities that have, that have problems with the police to talk to one another with respect and some patience with an eye to solving the problems that make it so hard for them to communicate. Uh, this is a very thing, easy thing for them to do. When this happens, all of a sudden you have the people in the communities, instead of saying the police, they start talking in terms of our police. And the police officers, instead of saying those criminals, start talking about the people that they are there to protect and serve. And when that happens, you have the harmony that you need for uh, a community that is at peace with itself and trying to solve its problems. Because problems affect everybody. They don't just affect one segment and not another. Uh, people think that, but the people who are making it end up having to, their tax burden increase just whether they want to, whether they want to buy more police protection or solve the issues of poor educational system, that costs money. So it costs money for um, civilization to move forward. That, that we all accept that, as long as it, it happens in a way that uh, makes sense. And uh, that type of communication, that bridging of, uh, uh, of two different points of view getting able to, to, to settle the, the means to go forward, th that's what we want. And that's what I'm, I try to encourage uh, uh, Coach Carroll and Bobby uh, to you know, talk to the various people that they knew. Because I know the people in the Seahawks organization probably know all of the uh, heads of police agencies in this area. Mm -hmm. And um, the, uh, the players, they know players on other teams. So th th this, can, this can get contagious. You know, the solution can be contagious, just as the way that problems have a tendency to be contagious. When you, as a former athlete, <laughs> when you, as a former athlete, write about political and social issues, you probably get a response, as I do, when I write on subjects that aren't sports. The common re refrain is, stick to sports not your business. And that's what we're seeing a little bit now with the, profession, uh, with the football players 
uh, Colin Kaepernick, and, uh, chief among them, who, um, it sounds like you all know what I'm talking about in terms of his national anthem protest, which is beginning to uh, resonate with a lot of other athletes, more protests are happening. And um, for some reason, we, we think about athletes as separate, not engaged with civilian life. And I, I always find that remarkable because governments all the time will associate with sports, with uh, not only with the anthem, but with uh, commemorations and, and, and military flyovers and all of that, and no one thinks anything about it. But when, when athletes engage in politics or, or social issues, somehow they're scorned or looked askance. And what is your response to those people who say, stick to basketball, stick to sports? Well, uh, it, it's impossible. When Jackie Robinson integrated baseball, he wasn't just doing that for, as, as a sportsman. He was doing that as an American citizen. And it meant that uh, black Americans, well, thank you. It was a principled stand. It was about, well, what does this country stand for? And uh, if equal opportunity is what America is supposed to be about, then he should have the opportunity to play baseball. And even people who didn't like Zach, uh, I think after that first, that first year he, he batted 348, uh, they realized he, he, he should be playing baseball. You know? <laughs> you know? the, uh, the notion of saying stick to basketball, as you write in the book, saying, well, should you say to a plumber, stick to plumbing if he has a political opinion? Or, you know, anyone else, we're all engaged in the same struggle with democracy and for democracy. Right. And it seems, I think utterly unfair for athletes to be held apart and say, don't make your political expression a part of the field or part of the uh, field of play. I don't understand where that divide comes from. Do you have any notion about separating sports from reality? Well, you, you can't separate sports from reality and the people who dislike athletes uh, voicing their opinions are the people who usually are jealous of the charisma that an athlete has. And uh, they wish they had that type of influence. Uh, they wish they could be as influential. And for example, uh, there's some people protesting uh, Barbara Streisand. Uh, she's a big supporter of Hillary. And people saying, well, why is she using her platform to support Hillary? Well, she thinks Hillary is right and uh, Barbara votes. So uh, Barbara's telling people why she votes. Uh, that's what the p political process is all about, and the uh, people who don't like it are going to have to deal with it. Yeah, having a p profile shouldn't disqualify you from political activism. Exactly. So, um, you also devote a chapter in the book, um, and this hits home with me, uh, not that all of these didn't, but from a professional standpoint, media. And you um, startled me with this... Uh, quote in the book, he said, the biggest threat to the American way of life is the relentless attack on news media from politicians and business leaders who feel journalistic, who, who fear journalistic scrutiny. Talk about that a little bit, about why this is such a threat. Well, th this is the threat to people who feel that they have to put their spin on all the um, borderline or sometimes criminal, well, we won't say criminal, but reprehensible things that they, they do. And they want everything depicted as they would spin it. And uh, people have a right to uh, take a different course on, on what you do uh, when what you do is seen to be uh, reprehensible. Uh, so, uh, you know, they, they despise the messenger because they're actually giving a clear message to the American people. I think Thomas Jefferson said that uh, uh, he would rather have a country with uh, a whole lot of newspapers than one with no newspapers. Right. He talked about government, if he had a choice between a, a cho government yeah, without newspapers or uh, he would say, I would clearly prefer no government. And, and prefer newspapers. And, and prefer newspapers because 
by checking out everybody's opinion on what they saw happen, that's how you get to the truth. And uh, the truth is what sets us free. And you had, um, in, 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 as a celebrity athlete, you had various slings and arrows with journalists and journalism over time, yet you have identified yourself as a journalist as well. And I'm, I'm wondering, uh, I, you have seen the movie Spotlight, We've seen other movies that are, have great social impact that feature journalism and the investigative arm. And you, and you um, quote Edward R. Murrow. This was a, one of my favorite quotes in, in journalism. He said, a nation of sheep begets a government of wolves. And that has always resonated deeply with me. And why do you sense that there is such uh, an antipathy towards the, the, pra the practice and the profession of quality journalism? For, uh, or is it just a matter that people find, uh, publishers and media owners find a way to make money by pandering to the lowest common denominator? Well, I, I think people don't, they dislike challenges to things that they think are true. So for example, um, all this warning about global warming and just all these people are saying, no, science, is not correct. And we're finding out every day as uh, atolls around the various oceans in the world are, are disappearing under the melting ice caps that, hey, maybe there might be some uh, global warming, but everybody tried to deny it because uh, change is something that uh, might have affected them in a way that uh, hurt their bottom line. And that's really what they were more interested in rather than protecting our environment. When it comes to the uh, reporting of politics and government, uh, it seems that there is um, an urgency to buy the words and, and own a dialogue, Fox News being the uh, prime example. What kind of threat is that when, um, when you can't trust uh, media sources to give people accurate information on the history that we can agree on? Well, I, I think it really does uh, all of us a disservice because they're not reporting the facts. They're reporting uh, what they see supports their point of view. Their agenda. And yes, it is an agenda. Uh, it's not just their point of view, it, it's an agenda. And uh, we all suffer for this because we, we end up uh, wasting time and, and precious resources uh, following a, on, a, on a fool's errand. You also devote a chapter in the book to um, ageism, something that doesn't get a lot of play because it isn't attractive to the 18 to 34 demographic in <laughs> most media. But I think you also said this is whistling past the graveyard <laughs> because we're all going to get old, we're all going to face difficulties, but we can't seem to revere and respect people of age. And what is your view on how this has come about? See, it's, it's hard to figure out why this is going on. You know, I know how I cared about my parents and uh, I respected them for what they experienced and the wisdom that they had to impart. Um, I think that's how we should feel about our, our elderly people. And not just because I'm becoming one, you know, I, <laughs> I feel that... But it uh, gets more acute. <laughs> it gets more acute as you get older, right? But uh, that is a whole lot of experience and wisdom about things that affect us still. Uh, so we, we have to appreciate what they have to offer and not uh, dis dismiss them as being useless. Uh, I, I, it's it's a, such an unfortunate waste of intellectual power. Um, we, we need all of it to, to continue to, to make this, as the, it says in the Constitution, a, a more perfect union. We, we can do that. You also uh, have, uh, at the end of the book, uh, an, an unsolicited advice, uh, unsolicited advice for future Americans. And uh, you make a, a wonderful statement about 
Generation Z. Uh, yes, they are the future, but that's a default setting, not a spiritual calling. <laughs> you know right? And, uh, and maybe you can talk a little bit about the advice that you want to give that younger generation about uh, a lot of the things that you touched on earlier in the book. Well, um, they're going to have to, to tr trust their own judgment um, at, as time goes on because they will lose the uh, perspective and vision of the people that went before them. But if they uh, don't take the time to thoroughly investigate everything as things go forward, they're going to make the mistakes and they will have some regrets. I had a chance this afternoon to talk to the people over at Google um, and just that we discuss, discussed my book and um, they asked me some questions about some of the issues I brought up in my book and it really impressed me because I, I could see that uh, these are the people that are going to be the ones that form, these are some of the people that are going to form what America is going to be like in 30 years. And uh, I was really pleased to have a chance to interact with them and find out what was on their minds and uh, see that uh, they, they care about our nation and where it's going. Uh, that, that really warmed me up a little bit because uh, as uh, this Trump phenomena started to manifest itself, I, I started to get worried, you know, I, I really did. You may not be alone. Uh, um. I don't think I am alone. <laughs> well, that brings up a point about the book and its genesis and it's happening now. What moved you to put together this? And clearly there's a lot of stuff that you've been researching and, and learning about over the course of time. You brought this all together now in a presidential election season. Tell us about why that happened. I think what has happened is it's just, these are things that I, I've worried about really my whole life because I, I saw how racial hatred could be so harmful for my people and my nation at the, at the same time. Uh, uh, Back in the 1950s and 60s when uh, black Americans were getting murdered just for trying to vote, it, it was a black eye for our country. It wasn't just a, a, a horrible thing happening to the black community. It was a black eye for our country. And uh, this is the greatest country in the world. This is the place where dreams come true because everybody has a chance to contribute. And we, it is a meritocracy. And we're going to make it more, a more and more effective meritocracy if we have uh, any chance of uh, uh, realizing our potential, we, we will continue to try to make it a meritocracy because that means that the smartest people get to make the decisions and that's what it should be about. And we have a very fair way, way of making those choices as to who our leaders are and who the people are that uh, are going to determine policy. So um, for me, um, I needed to do this. You know, this is something that... Uh, it, it's, it's my uh, turn to uh, just show this to my fellow citizens and hope that they will respond in a positive way and uh, hopefully use some of these ideas to continue to make America the place that I, I hope it should become. You mentioned the Google uh, group having and an elevated awareness, perhaps, of issues that uh, of interest. And I, I've noticed a resurgence about that from the standpoint of the passing of Muhammad Ali this summer, because his legacy was kind of dormant until the review of his life came before this generation and the sacrifices he made. Uh, and you knew Muhammad Ali. Um, there was a wonderful photo of you and uh, several great sports figures of the 1960s who were uh, together. And I'm wondering, uh, together in the 60s, and you guys kept in touch over time, Ali was transcendent. And I'm wondering what, upon his passing, you observe about people becoming aware 
of what he did, what he sacrificed three and a half years at the height of his career in order to make a point about the, injusti the injustice of the draft and all the other things that were happening with civil rights in the 1960s. Well, I, I think the thing that uh, made Muhammad Ali such a, a great hero and an American of the highest order was his integrity. Um, he was not going to sacrifice what he believed in just so he could continue to make money and placate the people who were trying to manipulate everybody into believing that we were fighting a just war in Vietnam. He wasn't going to play that game. And he was very comfortable with where he was because he knew that what he was doing was the right thing. It wasn't a convenient thing and it was going to, yes, cost him money and time and part of his career, but he was doing the right thing for his legacy and his uh, integrity as a man. And that was the only thing that was important to him. N nothing else mattered. Uh, everything else was secondary to that. And he, he let the chips fall. And finally, uh, the country got behind him because they realized that, yes, it was an unjust war and one that we shouldn't be fighting. And uh, he, he got his status re restored. But he, he paid a sacrifice for it. But uh, he was willing to do that just to, to, for an example. So for me, even as my friend, he was also my mentor. And I, I learned from him in that. And uh, I appreciated some of the things that he had done prior to that. I, I knew I had to support him. Uh, I remembered when he would uh, go by Sonny Liston's camp and, and bait him and chase Sonny Liston chased him around. And I realized he's going to win this fight because Sonny Liston's already lost his mind, you know? <laughs> it was, it was the funniest thing I, I remembered. And I, I just, I, I understood that he had it figured out. I think a lot of the reviews of uh, Ali's life have pointed out how, uh, how wise he was, even though he didn't have a conventional education. He, yeah, he did. He was dyslexic. He was dyslexic. Yeah. And, um, and so it, it struck me that there is a marvelous example of somebody who had, certainly he had, he was a, a gifted athlete, right. but he also worked extraordinarily hard. And he also made it a point to put himself in the face of white America. Right. And, and it was a, a very dramatic, a very uh, controversial thing that he did. I'm wondering what young athletes today can take from his example and the dramatic ends he went to to make his point. Well, I, I think he, had, he confronted America when they were in the wrong. But if uh, you gave him the respect that he deserved, he, he knew he was the greatest. He was. He, he, he proved it. He, he says, he told me, he said, if I can prove it, I'm not bragging. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I can see some of you gray-haired folks out there bet on Ali a couple of times. <laughs> so, you know, he, he, he proved it. And he, he, didn't, uh, he, he, he didn't do it with arrogance. He really was, was very humble, even though he was saying he was the greatest, he, he wasn't lying, and that was what he was supposed to say. It was the truth. Uh, the truth is what sets you free here. Mm -hmm. I got a funny story to tell you about him, if you want to hear it. The, the, <laughs> some people gave uh, Muhammad Ali about six or eight minor birds that were trained to say, Ali, Ali. <laughs> that's, all, that's all they said. Ali, Ali. So he, he would bring his kids to Laker games sometimes, and I'd see him, he'd come back to the locker room. So I, I, at one time I said, well, what, how's it going with those birds? That He said, listen, man, I come in at night, it's two in the morning, they're out there, so I'm like, Ali, I, I can't sleep. <laughs> Five in the morning, I'm, they wake me up, Ali, Ali. So I got rid of them birds. <laughs> so, but, but don't tell anybody. <laughs> So I, I've waited until now, until he's passing on. <laughs> I, can, I can tell that. Uh, he also had a great foil in Howard Cosell. And I always found that relationship fascinating because th they were such disparate people, such right, disparate were. personalities. Yet they uh, worked so well together despite this adversarial you know, supposedly adversarial 
relationship, but it really it was theatrics. Yeah, it was theatrical. They they were um, like uh, Abbott and Costello, actually. <laughs> um, they 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 were foils for each other. So um, you know, Ali was unpredictable, and Howard was totally by the book uh, how it was supposed to be done, and so proper. And Ali was so irreverent, and I, I think that that was the magic that they had. Uh, they. Um, uh, Ali said one thing uh, that Billy Crystal told me one thing that Ali said um, about Howard Costello as they had him in the coffin. Um, Ali asked Billy, firstly said, do you think God's going to recognize him without his toupee? We need him back. <laughs> so, Kareem, great to see you. I have a question about student athletes and whether or not they should be paid in the college level. I, I feel that student athletes should be paid. I think they are exploited. <laughs> the, the basketball and football athletes uh, in the NC2A make billions of dollars. It, uh, it allows the head of the NC2A to, to pull down a six or seven million dollar salary. They don't get anything. It's not right. All of the other sports depend on those two sports. Uh, I think they should find an equitable way to, um, to disperse the money among all of the scholarship athletes so that they got a chance to go to school and maybe uh, buy an automobile and take their girls out for dinner on Saturday <laughs> night. I think that's not asking too much. Uh, giving the huge amount of money that they make and the huge amount of good that they do for all the people who support uh, college sports. I think that uh, that, that would be the uh, appropriate thing to do. Um, the, one, la one last thing on that issue, you know, no, nobody pays any money to go see women's gymnastics or the, the, the water polo team, but uh, they still contribute to college life in a very meaningful way. So the money that's generated by the money-making college sports really does a lot of good. Um, I don't think it's a bad thing, but I think uh, that the student athletes deserve a lot bigger share than what they're getting because now it's just room, board, and tuition, which is amount, right next to nothing in terms of uh, what they deserve. Sir. Good evening. Uh, my name is Raymond Miller, and uh, I want to thank you for the skyhook and for putting yourself out here uh, for us to uh, hear your words of wisdom. Also, uh, a lot of Americans are saying uh, the theme, make America great again. I have my own personal beliefs on what, where that's coming from and what about it, but millions of Americans are looking for make America great again. But do you have some uh, insight on why they believe that America is not great today. And also, uh, I want to make a little comment when we said that, uh, you know, basketball players and plumbers shouldn't be involved in political activities. But I remind everybody that we were all citizens before we were basketball players or plumbers or doctors or lawyers. So I would like your comment. I don't think America is, is not great right now. I just think that someone is trying to exploit the uh, false appearance of uh, problems in our country and saying that America is not a great place. It's still the best place in the world and it's the only place that I want to live and, and raise my kids. So um, that's, that's what I think about that. Um, thank you very much for coming. I've enjoyed your talk and I've enjoyed your books. I've got a couple more that I didn't own. Um, my question is, um, uh, the profound difficulties, the divide we face in this country. Uh, the question I'd like to ask is, is uh, I noticed the reference to Arthur Ashe uh, that Bob Costas made on the uh, back of one of your previous books. Uh, somebody that, that spoke out in, in a sense about uh, what he perceived to be a degree of injustice in terms of uh, not requiring equal education and, and sort of athletic benefits uh, He's, he had a sense that this was doing a disservice to athletes in some way. Uh, he was roundly criticized for that approach by John Thompson and others. Uh, I, I'm sure you're probably aware of that controversy. It's come and gone many years ago. 
Uh, I first saw you in one of your high school basketball games at the University of Maryland a lot of years ago. Um, so I just wonder if, if you agree with Ash, is there a way that we can, we can improve education in this country uh, to an extent to overcome the, the, the deficits uh, in the minority communities? And, and how, would you, how can we best do that? Well, I, I think that uh, the best way to deal with the um, declining effectiveness of the American educational system is to make a commitment in tax dollars to uh, pay teachers a, a decent salary so that they can go do the wonderful job that they've been doing. Uh, we, we can't blame uh, our teachers for seeking um, more gainful employment when they're not being paid what they should be paying. And it's so crucial what, what they mean for our children and uh, our future. Uh, great teachers make uh, for a great nation. Our, our students have sank. We, our, our students used to be first in the world in so many important uh, academic pursuits. And now that's not happening because uh, we don't want to spend the money. So uh, I, I hope that uh, you know, we, we get wise to that and uh, make the commitment to spend the tax dollars to keep the really good, effective teachers in place and uh, let them do their thing. Good, uh, as, a, as a high school English teacher, I'm wholly with you, so thank you for the shout out. Um, so you and I are connected because my father was in uh, your first grade class of PS52 a um, long time ago. Um, and uh, I'd like to I have two questions, and I also, he's also a big jazz buff, as I know you are as well. Um, so two questions. One, harking back to the 50s, um, what do you think growing up in Washington Heights, like among, my dad was Jewish, and you know, among a whole different multicultural group, what did that teach you about race growing up in that environment? And also, um, I'd like to know if you have any jazz, jazz recommendations. <laughs> well, um, I had a wonderful time growing up in Manhattan. Um, my family moved to actually Inwood uh, from Harlem, but uh, we still were pretty close to Harlem. So it's like being close to home, but didn't have to deal with all the negatives that uh, Harlem was all about. And uh, I was able to get a good education going to school in, in Inwood. So that, that was, I think, the reason that my parents moved up there. Uh, they just wanted a better opportunity for me, and I was able to take advantage of it. And uh, that, that was the the most important part of that. Uh, I don't remember the second part of your question. <laughs> oh, for reparations. Do I have any jazz recommendations? <laughs> oh my goodness, okay. Uh, well, as a jazz fan, I, I, I like all of the classics, you know, John Coltrane, Thelonious Monk, Miles Davis, Charlie Parker, Dexter Gordon, um, Herbie Hancock. Herbie's still with us. That's wonderful. And uh, I think that uh, I'm always happy when people support jazz because it's the only art form that's uh, native to our country. And I'm really proud of it. At the beginning, you mentioned fear as being one of the, playing a role in the many divides we have in this country. And uh, fear is a very powerful feeling. And uh, when you spe specifically think about the fears of the white man population, it, it's you know, something that it's easy to discard. It's like, well, they're ignorant. They don't know what they're doing, whatever. You know, and you just want to get out of it. But then you have things like Trump. And Trump is successful because he's carrying to those fears. So I wonder whether there is something that we should do as individuals and as a nation to address that fear, because this is also causing the divide. The, the, the thing that kills fear is knowledge, knowledge of what the facts are. So speaking the truth uh, about things that people are trying to generate fear about, really, it, it dispels fear and lets people understand that uh, things are happening for a certain reason. It's not about boogeymen or communists or the fact that uh, a certain ethnic group are inherently criminal or ignorant or anything like that. It's about certain facts. So just uh, the truth is what makes us free, free to understand how, how we need to proceed. So facts kill all that fear and enable us uh, to move forward uh, in an intelligent and meaningful way. Thank you. Hi there. My name is Laura Ellen McKinney. I want to thank you for your activism and I need to admit something to you. 
I've been 6'1 since I was 11, and a lot of kids in my neighborhood thought that you might be related to me in some kind of way. <laughs> and, and they wanted, they kept bugging me, and they wanted autographs, and so I used to sign them and sell them, so I owe you $10. <laughs> 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 yeah. I wish I had a fabulous story like that. <laughs> I would love to hear your opinion on two things. Um, one theme I heard in your uh, talk today was um, American, the role of American citizens, and I'm wondering what, you, what your thoughts are on the role of undocumented immigrants in the United States. So that's one. And then two, um, your thoughts on um, LGBT and uh, queer athletes and how do we make sport more inclusive um, to queer folks? Well, uh, in, in terms of uh, immigrants, uh, I'm the grandson of an immigrant. My grandfather came to America in 1917. Next year will be 100 years of my family in America. And I, I don't think we have anything to fear from uh, undocumented Im immigrants. They usually are here for the economic opportunity, like my grandfather was, and they're here to uh, raise their kids in a place where there are more, even more opportunities. America is a wonderful place for, for those reasons. So uh, I'm, I'm all for undocumented uh, immigrants. I, I hope they will f figure out a way, uh, after they get through with all the gridlock in Washington, I hope they figure out a way to make some meaningful uh, immigration uh, reforms so that we can move forward because people will continue to want to come to America um, for the very reasons that, that I just uh, enumerated. And the LGBT? Uh, oh, as far as L LGBT, I, I think uh, the, the fact that uh, people see, want to see LGBT people as uh, a, a cancer on society when actually they have been part of so many society and had, had to live in, uh, in the closet. And it's good that they can be out of the closet and be themselves because they are, they are a part of us. They are our brothers and sisters, our fathers, our, our children. Uh, we, we have to accept them and understand them uh, because they are part of us, they are family. So um, that, that, that's a pretty simple issue as far as I'm concerned. Thank you for your question. Uh, Kareem, I'd first of all uh, like to thank you for uh, supporting D1 uh, college athletes. My son is a scholarship athlete. He's a freshman at San Jose State, the home of John Carlos and uh, Tommy. And uh, he, uh, every check that I've written in the past couple weeks uh, is painful. And uh, supporting, <laughs> supporting D1 uh, athletes uh, is important. He plays water polo and it's a non-revenue and it's painful. Um, but that being said, uh, I, uh, I grew up in Oakland, California. Uh, I went to Skyline High School uh, with Eric Fernston, uh, the great Boston Celtic Center. And, uh, he, and growing up in Oakland, I, as I stand here today, I treasure that experience because it was a very multicultural environment for me. And every day I, 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 I'm thankful for that experience growing up there. Um, but now I'm, I'm viewed, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a basic white guy. Uh, here in Seattle, and I consider myself a progressive. I believe in, in equity and equality in all respects. And I'd like to know what a person like myself uh, can do specifically to support racial, specifically racial uh, inequalities, because often I'm uh, uh, accused of, of white splaining, uh, and I don't feel that, but I'd like to know some specific ideas that you might have to help me to achieve racial equality and what I can, can do. Well, um, I, I would suggest that uh, you not overly concern yourself with race and just try to do the best you can, you can with the people that you know. I mean, it's, you don't have to look for people of a certain race. Uh, you can, but I, I don't think it's necessary. Uh, maybe it, it might not work out that way. You, you have no idea but uh, do the best you can for those that you care about. And as long as you don't uh, exclude somebody f for the trumped up reason of race, uh, I, I don't think you would have anything to worry about. Thank you. well, you're welcome.
I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but we only have time for maybe one or two more questions. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> jump in there. Um, hi, Kareem. Thanks for hi, being here. Hi, how are you? I'm pretty good. Um, my question kind of builds on that one about affirmative action, a tool used in educations and corporations for building diversity. Is it an effective tool to give advantage based on demographic? And if so, um, you know, what is the future of that? And are there other tools that could be used for building diversity in corporations where that doesn't exist right now? Well, I, I don't think that affirmative action programs are, are necessarily evil. Um, they can't be so skewed that uh, people get offended by them uh, or, or feel that uh, people that have legitimate uh, uh, interests are, are denied opportunity. But just giving opportunity to groups that have been traditionally denied the opportunity really helps change a few things. You just don't want to get carried away with it and, and have people think that it's being done unfairly or in a way that uh, is causing more problems than it's solving. Thank you for your question. You get the last one. All right. Last question. All right. Okay. Well, I, have a, I have a statement and also a question. So uh, first of all, my name is Edward Newbins. I'm also a Seattle U alumni from Seattle area. Uh, my statement is basically that uh, I think you're the greatest basketball player ever. And it's not because just your stats show that, but it's your activism. So I appreciate the activism that you put out there and also the, well, the, the opportunity you've given us to be able to look up to somebody and be a role model for us. Uh, my question is, as an Afri African-American male, um, coming from a community where we've been marginalized and things of that nature. We have opportunities to grow, but I, I like to think we can start within our own community. How would you, or what would you give advice for as far as young people right now, young Afro-Americans spe specifically, to be able to do grassroots campaigns? What kind of areas would you focus on for that and what would you tell them? Um, I, I didn't hear the, the last okay. thing that you said. As far as, uh, as far as being able to help our community, what would you tell young Afro-American uh, people in general to be able to start, like what areas would you tell them to focus on as far as helping the community, helping to grow themselves within I, the system? Okay, I think that the most important uh, issue, especially for disadvantaged communities like the African American community, are education. Uh, making it possible for parents, especially single parents, to get their kids to school and get them the support that they need beyond just getting them to school. You know, having people check on them, uh, having people mentor them when they, they need to learn how to deal with certain problematic aspects of their education, how to overcome those problems. I think that having those resources available to uh, kids from disadvantaged areas really goes a long way to helping them overcome that because they get to further their education, go to college, and, you know, college educa educated people usually get more done than uh, people who don't. So I think, especially in, uh, in minority communities, just the fact that they understand how big the world is and what the potentials are within the world, that really enables them to, uh, to give good advice and, and mentor people and bring them along who, like them, come from maybe single family uh, homes or have been uh, in the uh, welfare system or in the uh, foster child system. All of those things that, that support children and uh, parents who, who are having a tough time, I think really that goes a long way to, to healing a, a lot of the communities that, that are having the, the toughest time. Thank you for your question. I, well, yeah, we have to, we have to uh, bring this to a close. We could do this for hours. This has been most fascinating. And I would just like to recommend as someone who's finished the book, get this book into the hands of as many people as you can. It's that important, it's that good, it's that meaningful in this tumultuous time in American history. Thank you for attending and thanks to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar.